Tonight, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about something I've been thinking about, and I, I, I think it's, it's a topic that can help us process what we see God doing in our life in answer to our prayers. I want to talk to you about God's unique way of answering prayer. God's unique way of answering prayer. You know, every now and then you will pray a prayer and the answer will come very quickly and will come like you thought it would. For example, in the last 10 years, twice this has happened to Debbie and I where we were, at the time we had sold our home, we were looking for a home and on two different occasions, we pulled up to a house that was not for sale. We didn't know who owned it. We didn't know anything about the house. We'd never been in the house, but we felt led in that moment to pray, Lord, we don't know who owns this house, but the good news is this. In your kingdom, nobody has to lose for somebody to win. And so, Lord, we just pray you bless the family that owns this house, but cause them to want to sell this house to us. And Lord, let us be in the house in the next seven days. Amen. Both times, I mean, we did it, both times it was on a Saturday that we prayed the prayer, and uh, on the first time, uh, the following Wednesday, I'm walking into the prayer meeting, and somebody says, hey, have you guys found a house? I said, no. I said, hey, there's a guy, they haven't listed it, but they're thinking about selling it, and uh, we just think it would be perfect for you. Can I have him give you a call? I was like, great. Next day on Thursday, he gives me a call. He says, hey, you know, we'd be willing to work with you, et cetera, et cetera. And I didn't know them. They didn't go to the church in either situation. And so um, I said, well, uh, where is your house? And when he told me, I knew it was the exact house we had just prayed for. And I, I said, well, when can we see it? He said, how about tomorrow? So seven days after we prayed it, prayed the prayer, we were there. And that's happened two different times. So we prayed it, and it happened almost exactly like we pictured it. But can I just tell you this? That is the exception, not the rule when it comes to prayer. That oftentimes I've found that my prayers and God's answers don't look alike at all. That God answers my prayer, but he answers it in a way that's different than I imagined. And the problem is, if we aren't careful, is we're praying our prayers if we get caught up in our own ideas of how God is going to answer it and what God ought to do and the way it's going to work out, you say, but didn't that happen to you? Listen, in that moment, there are times uniquely where God puts faith in your heart to do something that even as you're doing it, you're thinking, this is wild, but I really feel this is God. But then other times, you're praying and you're asking God to do something in your life, and my experience has been that my prayers and his answers often don't look anything alike. And if I'm not prepared for that, if you're not prepared for that, what happens is then we can find ourselves thinking, well, God didn't answer the prayer. God isn't doing anything about the prayer. God isn't working in the way, because he isn't working in the way we thought. We think he's not working, and that's not true at all. And we can find ourselves looking for something different than he's doing, and we miss what he's doing. In Isaiah chapter 55, one of my favorite chapters uh, in the book of Isaiah, it's a chapter on turning to the Lord. It's a chapter on the Lord's ability to work in a situation to completely transform it. It can take, by the end of the chapter, it's a call to salvation, but how God can take something that's a thorn bush and turn it into a tree. God can do that in the lives of people, totally, radically, powerfully transform their life. The idea in the chapter overall is that God is reaching out to Jews and Gentiles. His heart is to save them. And that would have been uh, very mind-blowing for Jewish people, that God would want to reach Gentiles. 
And so God says this, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Boy, is that a great verse. Right now, you can find God. Right now, he's near. Right now, he's in this place. Right now is a good time to call on him. If you're at the West Campus or at Joplin or watching online or at the North Campus or right here, now is a good time to call on God. Whatever it is you need, he's here. The worship team led us into the throne room, right? So he says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. In other words, when it comes to how God is working, God says you have to be careful about what you're thinking. That sometimes we're thinking in a way God is not thinking. I think that gets a lot of Christians in trouble. I think Christians become so committed to their own ways of thinking, their own ideas, that if they're not careful, they miss what God wants to do, and they get discouraged along the way. You say, what do you mean? Well, I thought I'd be married by age 30. I thought that my spouse would be saved by now. I thought that I would have a better job at this point in my life. I thought that I would, I would gain admin, a, a, admission to that university. I thought God would heal me last Sunday. I thought that church would be different. I thought my marriage would be different. I thought, and God says you have to forsake your thoughts. You have to let go of your thoughts. You have to forsake what you thought your marriage would be like or what your future would be like. You have to be careful what you do. On the one hand, we know God is good and we expect good things. On the other hand, we ought to leave the details up to him. We ought to say, God, my hope is in you. When Debbie and I got married, the pastor who married us closed the, the uh, service portion, his message, with a scripture that at the time I thought was unique, but I've never forgotten it. And I've ended up quoting it to myself all of my married life. In fact, all of my ministry has just been a verse that I just always remembered because it was so unique when he said it. Uh, and that's the power of the word of God. It's Psalm 62 and verse 5, my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from the. This is good advice for marriage. You're getting married. You better wait on God and let him give you your expectation, right? I mean, I thought Debbie would love waxing my truck and helping me do that all of our married life. I pretty much ended after, after we said I do. You, everybody goes into marriage with expectations, right? I thought that she'd bring me breakfast in bed. I thought that he'd bring me flowers every week. I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought. You have to let go of your personal expectations. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from thee. In fact, in ministry, the, the whole thing with, with what we've experienced over the years, I mean, honestly, in some sense, I had no expectation. I had no idea. I didn't know what God was going to do. I just said, God, whatever you want to do, that's what I want you to do. Now back to Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he'll have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Here's what God is saying. God is saying, I'm not thinking like you're thinking. My ways of getting you what you want or what you need in your life are different than your ways. 
I want to bless you. I want to work in your life. I just didn't tell you how I was going to bless you. You thought it was going to be through your job, but I'm going to bless you in a different way. You thought it was going to happen at the Wednesday night prayer meeting, but I'm going to do it on Thursday morning. You don't realize it, but if you're not careful, what can happen is we can be worshiping our thoughts of how God is going to work rather than saying, God, I'm forsaking my thoughts. I want to know what you want in my life. Here's the, you know, God wants to work in our life, but he's always, almost always, in my experience, going to do different than our thoughts. He's going to do things we can't begin to imagine. I mean, that's what Paul says, right? Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or imagine. He does different. Because God's heart, God's mind, God's perspective, God's love is so much bigger than we can imagine. He'll do things in our life, but in his way. And how many know his way is better? You know, see, some of you tonight, you're, you're too committed to how you think God should answer your prayer. He's going to answer your prayer. That's not the question. But if you're so busy looking for him to answer your prayer in the way you expect him to answer it, you may very well miss the answer that's right in front of you because you don't recognize it. God's answers are supernatural because he's a supernatural God. And his ways are different than our ways because he's supernatural and we live in a natural world. And so many times we, if we're not careful, can begin to ask things and expect things and we're better off to say, God, here's the need. I can't wait to see how you're going to meet the need and then be open rather than telling God what we think he ought to do. Some of you are too smart for your own good. You think you know best how God should answer your prayer and God is not your genie. God works in his ways and his ways are not our ways. I think of it when we were building this church, it was the first, you know, in our ministry, really the first massive amount of money that we would need, millions and millions of dollars that we would need to build this. And so, um, because we hadn't done it, we hired a, a firm to help us raise the money, which is very typical if you don't know what you're doing, and we didn't. And so they come in and, and, uh, they tell you how to do it. They say, hey, listen, you know, you're going to raise this much money. You decide how much you're going to raise, and then you got to have a 10% gift, and then you got to have a 1% or a 5% gift, and then you got to have a bunch of other, and they give you all these percentages. So, I mean, if you're going to raise, if you need 15 million, then you need somebody to give you 1.5 million, and then you need somebody to give you 750,000, a couple of those, and then you need, and it goes down the line like that. So, my way was for God to bring a few people who would write big checks. I mean, I prayed that way because that's what they said you had to do. God's way was to send a lot of people who would write much smaller but very significant checks. His way was different than my way. God delights and confounding the wisdom of the wise. In fact, that the, the fundraising group, they said, please, uh, before we did the ask, they said, we just need to tell you a couple things. First of all, your campaign's going to be a failure because you didn't do what we asked you to do. And uh, please don't tell anybody ever that you used us. And I mean, they told me this in the office. And then when the campaign was a success, they're like, okay, you can tell people you used us. Just don't tell them what you did. Um, but it was so miraculous because it was God's way of doing what he wanted to do in a way that was best for the church, in a way that has been a testimony to his glory and grace repeatedly through the years. I mean, I have pastors. I sit down with pastors like, I'll bet you had some people write some massive checks. I was like, uh, not really. I mean, honestly, now this is just, I give you a little insider information. On this building, we had, we had um, six people who made six-figure commitments. The biggest was 150000 Of the six people who made six-figure commitments, only two paid anything. One person paid $5, and the others didn't pay anything. 
I'm just simply telling you, God's ways are different. And his ways are miraculous. And when you let him work in the way he wants to work in your life, you'll be shocked and it will be a testimony of his goodness and of his power and of his ability to do the impossible and to defy what the expert said could or couldn't happen, right? Isaiah 55 verse 7, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Now, let me give you an example of how this works, because sometimes we get in our mind this idea of how God's going to work, and if we're not careful, we will miss actually what he's doing. Let's go to Exodus chapter 16, verse 2, a great, great passage in the Bible. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to him, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, forgetting the fact that they were slaves and being beaten and probably didn't have as much as they thought. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Let me just say this. Be very wary of people who are living in the past or remembering the past all the time, because the past gets better and better the farther you get away from it. It wasn't so hot. The good old days weren't so good, okay? Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. God says, you need food? I'm going to give you bread. Here's what happens. The Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you'll get meat, and in the morning you'll be filled with bread. Then you'll know that I am the Lord your God. And that evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost, so frosted flakes, <laughs> on the ground, <laughs> appeared on the desert floor. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, manna. You say, what? They said, manna. Manna means, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. They say, we need bread. God says, I'm going to send bread. But when he sends bread, they're saying, what is it? We don't even know what it is. What would they have recognized? They would have recognized Egyptian bread. God sends the bread of angels. Which would you rather have? I'd rather have the bread of angels. I mean, listen to this. In chapter 16, verse 31, the people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers with honey. I mean, wafers and honey, that's a good combination. That sounds great, doesn't it? God called it bread. They called it, what is it? They thought God's answer would look a certain way, but instead it looked different than they expected. So much so that if God hadn't explained it to them, they would have missed it. I read that and I think to myself, how many times have you or I been praying and asking God to answer a prayer and he's actually answered it, but we don't see it because it doesn't look like the answer we were expecting. And the answer is right in front of us. Here's the dangerous thing about that. Sometimes there's an expiration date on the answer. Look at this. It's very interesting. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as he needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. In other words, God's answer was there for a short time, not a long time, and you either took advantage of it or you were out of luck. How many times is God working in our life? Listen, if we're so committed to our own thinking, our own ways, and, and we have in our, own, in our mind our own picture of how God's going to do it, and he's doing something else, and if we're not aware, if we're not open, if we're not sensitive, if we're, if we're not saying, God, listen, it's not about me, it's about you, and Lord, I'm just asking you to have your way in my life. I know you're a God who answers prayer. Your scripture repeatedly says it, and so whatever answer you want to send my way, I'm ready for it, I'm waiting for it, and Lord, just help me to see it when it comes, because I know 
My thoughts aren't your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. I know you have a totally different way of doing it. You see, there are windows of opportunity. And you can miss the opportunity God has given as he's answered a prayer if you don't recognize it and see that was true for them. As well, sometimes God's answer comes to us and requires a four-letter word response on our part. Work. God answers. He gives the raw material, but he expects us to do our part. Watch this. It says, so bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Listen, the manna didn't come from heaven as a beautiful cinnamon roll. It didn't come as a nice croissant. It came as a coriander seed that tasted like a wafer, but with honey on it. In other words, God wasn't going to get an oven and bake it for him. In fact, he wasn't even going to send him a recipe book. He's like, boil it, bake it, do what you want, figure it out. And the reason why is because God isn't interested in working for you. He's interested in working with you. If God just answers every single request and he just becomes a genie, then you're simply using him to get what you want and moving on. But God wants us to have the kind of mind like Jesus had, the kind of mind that says, I only do what I see my Father doing. The mind of Christ that says, not my will, but thy will be done. And Lord, show me your way and show me how you want to work and show me what you want to do. And Lord, help me not to miss what it is that you're doing in answer to my prayers, lest I miss the opportunity or lest I miss the moment when I can partner with you to bring about the completion because you've given me the raw material that will result in the answer to that prayer. Again, God wants to work. Maybe tonight you've been praying and he's answered. You just didn't see it because you're more committed to your own thoughts than you are to his thoughts. Or you're committed more to your own ways than you are his ways. Or you're more committed to your own convenience than you are the ways he wants to stretch you and he wants to move you. Maybe it didn't dawn on you that in your prayers, the answer to it was an opportunity that would require something of you rather than him doing something for you. And honestly, and I love to read the testimonies, but honestly, like it applies to everything you can think of. It can apply to your finances and provision. It can apply to your relational issues that can happen in a, in a family or in, with friendships. It can apply to, to healing. Where people have this idea, this is how God is going to heal me. If, I, if God's healing, then this is the way it's going to work. And God is not going to work according to the way we think he should work because his ways aren't our ways, his thoughts aren't our thoughts, but he's going to work. And some people concluded healing wasn't going to come when in fact healing was right at the door. They didn't recognize it. And some people quit because they thought, why didn't he heal me now when in fact he was putting together the raw material for the answer that would result in your healing, but you weren't patient enough, you weren't discerning enough, you weren't willing to see what is it that God is doing. God, let me just clear away all of the debris of my thoughts and my ways so I can see your thoughts and see your ways, and Lord, show me your ways. I mean, this is, we talked about it in the, the Psalms, uh, I think it's Psalm 103. Um, he showed Moses his ways and Israel his works. In other words, all Israel saw was the end result. 
Moses saw how and why and where and the way God was working and who God was and, and, and is and wanted to be to the nation of Israel and to Moses and in their circumstances, how God wanted to demonstrate who he was. And that's what all of this is about is God wants to work in your life and in my life and in the church, but he wants to do it in a way where it, it grows our understanding of what an incredible and what an amazing God he is. But if you're more committed to what you think and your thoughts and your plans than you are to his, you'll miss much of what God wants to do in your life. Isaiah 55, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he'll have mercy on him and our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. He's a God who answers prayer, but he does it in his way. And if we're not willing to let God be God in our life and have his way, if we're not willing to say, Lord, have your way in my life, you're the one that's in charge. Lord, you know what I need, and I submit to you and say, put the answer in front of me and open the eyes of my heart so I can see it and enlighten my mind so I can understand what I'm to do with what you're doing that I might see the answer you've sent. You got to forsake your thoughts. You got to say, you know what? God, you're a God who answers prayer. It's not wrong to ask God to answer prayer, but just leave how he does it up to him. He doesn't need your ideas. He's, he's not looking for advice. Like, oh, I don't know, man. How would you want me to do that? He's not typically doing that. We're praying, and he's saying, let me show you how much I love you. Let me show you how big I am. Let me show you how creative I am. Let me show you what I can do for you. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we want to let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.